we tested blenders like the Blendtec, for example, that <laughs> it will literally blend rakes. The world of kitchen gear can be tough to navigate. There are thousands of products competing for a place in your kitchen. And they're in all different categories at different prices and different levels of quality. It's all too easy to make a bad investment, especially when you're looking at big ticket items. Today, we are going to be talking about a bunch of expensive kitchen gear. Some of it we think is worth saving up for, others, not so much. Lisa and I are here to help you avoid that dreaded buyer's remorse. First up, Hannah. First, I want to talk about indoor pizza ovens, specifically this one right here. But before we get into that, make sure to like this video and hit subscribe. It really helps out the channel. A couple years ago, we rounded up a slew of indoor pizza ovens and tested all of them. And to be honest, the results were disappointing. They were not good. Our solution for baking pizza at home indoors was a pizza stone or a pizza steel. We slightly prefer a steel, a little more durable, conducts heat a little bit differently and making a slightly more tender and airy crust. The downside is to get great results with a pizza stone or steel, you'd need to preheat your oven for an hour. Now that's a long time. So when Breville announced the pizza yolo, pizza yolo. our producer Will speaks Italian, he wants everyone to know. But when Breville announced this, we were super excited and we had to put it to the test. This thing promises to reach 750 degrees professional pizza oven temperatures and to do so in 10 to 20 minutes. Also attention grabbing, the price is, is a thousand dollars. But this machine promises a lot. So we bought one and tested it. That's right, we bought one. We purchase all of our own products and we never accept advertising. This is not an ad, remember that. Let's start with how it works. There are two coiled heating elements, one underneath the stone and one in the roof of the oven. And it has seven settings, everything from pan pizza, thin and crispy, to wood fired. It also has a manual mode where you can dial in exactly what you want. To test this thing out, we held a two week pizza party in the kitchen. And even our most seasoned pizza makers here were thoroughly impressed. This machine put out beautiful pizzas, thin, tender with crispy crusts, we were really amazed at what this can do. By the end of testing, we all wanted one of these things. The oven heats up quickly and stays hot. It can cook some pizzas like thin crust in two to four minutes. It also stays relatively cool on the outside. You know, you wouldn't want to lean up against it, but it does stay relatively cool. We also really like that the pizza stone slides outwards and downwards when you open the door, so it's safer and easier to reach. When you close the door, it slides right back into position. The controls were super easy to use clear dials, easy to understand. Now let's get into the drawbacks. Obviously price is a major one. This thing is expensive. Also weight, it's about 30 pounds um, and it also takes up a lot of counter space or a lot of storage space. You're also gonna expect some discoloration from cooking. You'll see that here and on the door. And this is after only a couple uses. The peel is 11 inches, the stone is 12 inches. That means this can make smaller scale pizzas. So larger recipes, you're gonna need to scale down gonna cook more on one side than the other. So if you want it to be even, you're gonna need to rotate it during cooking. That's what we liked and didn't like about this machine. Let's make some pizza. Look at that. Beautiful, it smells good. Could have taken it a little darker if that's your preference. Underneath, really beautiful. Lots of semolina on there because I was worried about it sticking to the peel, but nice dark spotting there. Toppings are cooked through. The tips of the onions just started to char, which is just how I like them. This looks gorgeous. I can't wait to cut into it. Sounds crispy. Pick this one up. Look at that. Gorgeous. So should you spend or should you save? Let us know what you think in the comments, but as far as we're concerned, it's a yes for the Breville Pizziolo. If you have a thousand bucks to spend and you love pizza, it really delivered on what it promised. Now, if you don't have a thousand bucks and love pizza, don't worry, a baking steel and an hour preheat in your oven can also get you fantastic results at home. Now, a new competitor just entered the market, the Uni Volt. We are waiting for one to be delivered right now and we will be testing it and reporting back shortly. Mm. It's legitimately very good. Next up, smart cocktail machines, which have been all the rage recently. We tested a whole bunch of models. We found they fell into two categories. First was smart scales that walk you through how to make a cocktail. And the second was similar to a Keurig or a Nespresso machine. They use pods like this that contain concentrated juices, 
bitters and other flavorings that combine with water and liquor in the machine through a series of tubes to mix you up a cocktail. The machine reads the barcode on top so it knows just what to do. You pop it in, close it, and it's as simple as that. This is one of the Keurig style machines right here. This is Bartesian. We tested two of their models in addition to several, including the Bev by Black & Decker. And let me just cut right to the chase. Do not buy one of these. You know, the best cocktails are made using a variety of ingredients, including fresh juices. And these are not going to deliver that. You're limited to whatever they make and whatever they put inside this little plastic capsule. And these are not cheap. And they were often out of stock or hard to source. We did, however, like some of the smart scales. Right here, we have our winner, the Perfect Drink Pro. It will walk you through how to make a cocktail step by step. If you're looking to learn more about how to make cocktails, this might be a good choice for you. And at 100 bucks, it's a lot less expensive than the pod style models. We loved this machine. It was easy to use, easy to set up, nice controls, had a good app that really held connection with our phones, but in general, if you want to get into making cocktails more, we recommend just upgrading your bar gear. You know, we've got great shaker winners by Boston Shaker and Tavolo, winning jiggers, bar spoons, all of the good gear. We'll link it down below so you can find our favorites. Just get yourself some new good gear. Forget about the machines. One of the most common questions I get as an equipment tester is, are expensive blenders like the Vitamix here worth it? Now, we have tested blenders across all different prices. We have winners in the inexpensive category, in the mid-range category, and in the high-end category. And that's because not everyone can spend $500 on a blender. But if you can, should you? This is our longtime winner here for the high-end category, the Vitamix 5200. This machine got its start in the restaurant world and migrated over to home kitchens. There are just three features on its control panel, an on and off switch, a speed dial, and a switch that accesses a second level of power. While it's simple, there is little you can't do in this machine. What often separates the less expensive models from the expensive models is their warranty. Now, the Vitamix has a seven-year warranty, but you will often find these machines in use way past seven years, especially if you take good care of them. It has a powerful motor, but power wasn't everything. The Blendtec, for example, the highest wattage model we tested, we actually found the blender went too fast to properly emulsify mayonnaise. Soups made in there were often extremely frothy. The Vitamix, on the other hand, had a wattage of about 1,500, and it churned out better results than those in the 2,500 wattage range, proving that power is not everything with blenders. One thing that the Vitamix 5200 does really well is create dense, velvety blends, and that comes down to the shape of its jar. You'll notice it's taller and skinnier. This design allows the contents to stay concentrated more towards the bottom of the jar. Once the jar gets wider, the ingredients have farther to travel, they're crashing around inside, that generates foamier results. So this model here will not fit under a standard cabinet height. We also recommend the Vitamix A2500. The jar is a little bit wider, but at 17 inches, it will fit nicely under there. Slightly frothier results, but still super smooth and creamy. Noise is also a consideration with blenders, and I'm not going to tell you that any of these were quiet, but we definitely preferred models that were under 100 decibels. We measured with a decibel meter, and this model was much quieter than its competitors. A note on cleaning, don't put these in the dishwasher. They can warp. And if you want to make your own self-cleaning mode, just put a little bit of soap and water in there and run it on high for a minute. All right, so the Vitamix, worth it or not, what you're really paying for is longevity. And we've even heard of these being passed down from generation to generation. We do think a Vitamix is worth it. Now here's Lisa with her picks. First up on my list, the Thermomix. This is an all-in-one machine and they're really popular throughout Europe, Australia, five-star restaurants, even on luxury yachts. Is it worth it for your kitchen? The Thermomix and all of these all-in-one machines work kind of similarly. They have an enclosed heating element in the base and then they have a jar on top and they come with a bunch of attachments to do a whole bunch of things that let you cook everything in this one vessel. We compared it one-to-one -to, -one to each of our winning appliances in three categories. Our favorite food processor, our favorite stand mixer, and our favorite blender because they promised to replace all of those appliances with one appliance. Let's talk about how it compared to a stand mixer. We made dough in the stand mixer and in this. And in fact, 
did a great job. We compared it to our favorite food processor and we tried to make mirepoix where we were chopping carrots, onions, and celery. It chopped all right, but the problem is to check on this one, you're either peering in this little hole in the top or stopping it and taking the whole lid off. We had to keep stopping and adjusting and really trying to get a sense of exactly how to achieve a chopped mirepoix. It was not easy. So there is a big learning curve. Food processors can also slice or shred. The Thermomix doesn't have those attachments. It just has little blades at the bottom to stir and chop. So then we compared it to the blender. So like Hannah said, you really need a narrow jar with the food kind of pressed up against those blades to get really great blending action. This jar, it's a little bit stout. We made our favorite smoothie with kale and frozen pineapple and orange juice. We made that in our regular blender, great results. Beautiful, green, uniform. This not as well. And there were still some chunks that were unprocessed because it is a big wide jar. Not bad in a pinch, not great. So I would score one for the blender here. What it does do is it also cooks. It has the heating element, which is enclosed in the base. It has lots of settings. It has access to an online database of recipes if you subscribe. And there's a lot of user content out there for Thermomix. So we struggled a little bit when we were cooking in this. You cannot remove the blades. They're always turning. And so if you're not careful, you're going to get this effect where you're pureeing everything that you're going to cook. Meat, while you're trying to brown it, is moving too much to really brown because it isn't staying in contact with that hot surface. The problem is it's very hard to use a recipe that wasn't developed by this machine. That's just too limiting. And at this price, it really should be able to do more. So is this thing worth it? If you really want to be in the Thermomix world, sure, I guess so. It's $1,500, but if you want to save some money and get a lot more function, honestly, I would stick to our winning food processor, our winning stand mixer, and our winning mid-price blender, because each of those can do more in its own way than this can, and all three together cost less than this one machine. Next up, copper skillets. Now, copper skillets and other copper cookware have always been associated with fine cooking. Here in America, Julia Child famously had a whole pegboard full of copper pans in her wall of her kitchen, which is now in the Smithsonian. Copper transfers heat second only to silver in terms of the speed at which it can transfer heat. And so when you turn the heat up, it gets hotter, down it gets cooler almost instantly. And that responsiveness makes it really desirable. It's about one and a half times as responsive as a aluminum and 25 times more responsive than stainless steel. The other thing you need to know is that copper is highly reactive, which means that when it's with acidic ingredients, tomatoes, citrus, it will leach copper into your food. It is actually poisonous if you get a ton of copper. That has to be lined for cookware. And the lining has come down to two materials in general. The traditional one is tin. It can be made very, very thin. It actually has a little bit of nonstick property. The problem is it is not heat safe above about about 425 degrees. It's going to melt and come off the pan. We tested a pan that was lined with tin. We we're simply browning some butter in it and we did wreck the lining. The newer method is to line it with a very, very, very thin layer of stainless steel. Any cookware material that's super responsive, you can get hot spots because it's really picking up and transferring that heat to the food. Stainless steel likes to retain heat. It spreads gradually. It's a little less responsive, but it's more durable. It's totally non-reactive and it's going to even out that heat a little bit. A really good copper skillet is going to have a fairly thick layer of copper, very, very thin layer of stainless. Our winner here is by Movial. This one is 90% copper, 10% stainless, which works out really well. And that also leads to the next point about copper skillets. Copper is super expensive. This costs almost four times as much as our winning tri-ply fully clad pan from All Clad, which has stainless aluminum stainless, and it comes with a lid. So is it four times as good a pan? It's very nice, it is beautiful, but it did not perform four times as well as this tri-ply pan from All Clad. Copper is not induction compatible. So you can use this on induction. You can't use a copper skillet like this on induction. We do have an option if you really want to get some copper in your cookware, and that's this one. It's called a copper core pan, and they cut away a little bit right here so you can see that there's copper in there. This is a multi-clad pan with copper as its middle layer. So it's stainless, aluminum, copper, aluminum, 
stainless. They can put a ferrous layer on the outside of stainless steel so it's induction compatible. And this is a beautiful pan. It cooks amazingly. But this is about twice the cost of this one. Is copper four times as good, twice as good? Performance-wise, you're much better off saving that extra money and buying this fully clad pan with stainless aluminum stainless. And it performs very similarly to these much more expensive copper pans. Next up, stand mixers, specifically high-end ones. Now, we recently tested stand mixers at all price points. This was in the mix. This is a new one. Um, it's new to the United States. It's been going in Sweden and throughout Europe since the 1940s. This is called the Anka Shroom. It has a very radically different design from what we're used to with KitchenAid, which really sort of set the standard in the United States. I have to admit, when we first got this one out of the box, I did not know where to begin or what was what. I, after total confusion and a lot of research and watching a lot of YouTube videos because the manual is not that specific, I figured it out. So unlike what we know of as a stand mixer from KitchenAid, where the motor is in the horizontal head on top of the bowl, the bowl sits on top of the motor, which is enclosed in the base. The bowl turns rather than the beaters, which is kind of different. And the parts are a little odd looking as well. I mean, typically you'll have a whisk for whipping cream and egg whites, paddle for beating batters, and you'll have a hook for dough. This does have those parts, but they look a little different. This is the dough hook. And it travels around the bottom of the bowl, and this part comes up. Next to it, you'll find this blade, and this scrapes continually while it's being kneaded by this dough hook. Third, when you're whipping cream or mixing batter and dough, there is this bowl, which is a clear bowl, and you take off the metal bowl, you put on a stem, this sits on there, the tools will travel around in the bowl. This is an easier way to get at all the ingredients in the bowl when you're trying to whip egg whites or whipped cream. And there's smaller paddles that you can put on to do cookie dough. When you want to do bread dough, pizza, anything like that, this giant steel bowl and these really heavy duty hooks, you can replace the hook with this, which is a roller, and it literally rolls the dough against the wall of the machine. You can really work a stiff, heavy dough, and you can do a ton of it because it's a big bowl. With a stand mixer, it's all about the torque, which is the twisting force that can push the dough around, move it around the bowl. And this has a ton of torque. In fact, this machine is guaranteed for seven years and the manual practically dares you to try to break it. We made really stiff, dry bagel dough and it's totally fine. You can watch it through this open bowl and that is really fascinating too because you can really see what's going on and adding ingredients is so much easier because there's no big head containing a motor over the top. Uh, not to name names, but <clears throat> KitchenAid tells you never to knead dough above speed two. And the latest one we tested, the, the high-end one that compares to this one, it is a great, great machine. It has 11 speeds and you can only knead dough up to speed two, which is telling me that they're trying to protect their machine a little bit. Now that said, we mixed dough in it, it took longer, but it came out fine. But having to kind of rein it in and make sure that you're not damaging the motor, it was refreshing to not have that. You can go as high as you want in this. With a lot of stand mixers, especially inexpensive ones, they will really struggle when you're mixing doughs that are challenging. They'll rock, they'll walk, they try to climb off the counter and jump onto the floor. This did not walk, this did not move. It was kind of awesome. And the other thing is, honestly, when you think about KitchenAid, some of the things that make that a little more worthwhile are the attachments. In this case, you actually turn this whole machine on its side. So it comes with a blender, a grain mill, a pasta maker, an ice cream machine. It does all the things that you would have an attachment for with KitchenAid for the most part, but they're exclusive to this machine. So you're not giving anything up there. It is around the same price, within $100 of our top of the line, highly recommended seven quart KitchenAid Pro. It actually has some things that we like just as well, maybe even a little bit better. In terms of, is it worth it? If you are a person who bakes a lot, you may wanna invest in this. You know who you are if you're the kind of baker who has burned out machines before. We've had some really great reports from readers commenting to us, so we did test it. You have two choices. KitchenAid is not the only name in the game. Okay, so now you've seen Hannah's picks and my picks. So we hope you have a little bit better idea of when to spend and when to save so you don't get that dreaded buyer's remorse. For more information on all the gear we talked about today, check out the links below or go to americastestkitchen.com. 
What do you think? Is any of the gear we talked about today worth it for you? We're sure you'll let us know in the comments. Make sure to like this video and hit subscribe so you never miss an episode.